thanks very, very much. Um, yes, I, I must tell you, I, I had this very frightening professor at Hammersmith Hospital, postgraduate medical school, uh, John um, uh, Camel McClure Brown, who I once showed my CV to before uh, applying for a job to another university. And I thought he'd read it through for me and just correct it. And he went through it for about 15 minutes while I sat in his study going, woof, woof, you know, and grunting, marking it with a pencil. And I hadn't posted it, so, you know, and then finally he looked up at me over his half-moon glasses and said, well, Winston, when I read my CV, I don't recognise myself either, and just put... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm going to um, talk about uh, this subject. Um, this is Francis Galton, and um, you, can tell it's, you, you can tell he's a eugenicist because he's got this self-satisfied smile on his face. <laughs> Um, and Galton, of course, um, some of you will recollect that um, he was at a, a very minor university in Bloomsbury, um, rather not that far from Imperial College. Um, and he, of course, became professor of genetics. He was unquestionably something of a genius because by the age of five, he could read Latin and Greek. He um, was an explorer. He explored parts of Africa. Um, he was a very distinguished mathematician, and certainly he and others like him really got statistics going in a serious sort of way. And he was um, very important in trying to understand something that we're still trying to understand in our society, which is the inheritance of intelligence. And now, of course, it's all uh, Robert Plowman from... Um, from King's College, who makes the, the headlines. But in those days, uh, Galton, who was a cousin of Darwin, uh, was convinced that we should try as a society to encourage survival of the fittest, and he felt that we could do that in a society by making it eugenic, um, i.e. trying to encourage the best people to breed and the least able people not to breed. So here you see... Um, his, um, his lovely um, family trees, two, two family trees he drew up, one with normal inheritance, a great family this, with no uh, hidden nasty genetic tendencies, and a defective inheritance here where there were some who were insane, some who were feeble-minded, one or two who were blind or tubercular, some were supported by the ratepayers, um, <laughs> and some, uh, can you imagine, were at poor law schools, obviously not fit to breed. Um, and he argued that um, these should be discouraged actively. What was amazing about eugenics was that this idea really took on in a very big way. It's difficult to imagine the impact it had, but people like um, Lloyd George um, at one point, H.G. Uh, Wells, George Bernard Shaw, a whole range of very distinguished uh, individuals, uh, many of them politicians, uh, felt that this was absolutely desirable for a better society. And, of course, he'd, he'd written this book, uh, hereditary genius. And rather touchingly, he decided to prove that genius was inherited by looking at families who he thought would be clever. So, for example, where, for example, the judges of England were all interrelated uh, between 1860 and 1885, 1865, so he showed a whole range of judges who all became lawyers, and he showed that these were much more intelligent than other people because they were, in fact, inheriting their genius. And he also, of course, rather less convincingly to our modern eye, chose statesmen, i.e. politicians. Bizarrely, ladies and gentlemen, he looked at the English peerage. Enough said about that. However, where his mathematics fell down, and this was, shows how uh, lacking in objectivity he really was, he, when he came to uh, scientists, uh, poets, musicians and painters, he was actually really, though he doesn't say this in the book, pretty well unable to demonstrate much evidence of hereditary genius. Um, actually, if you think about musicians, which is an area I'm particularly interested in, I can only think of really one clear-cut case of inherited musical ability that seems obvious, which is Johann Sebastian Bach, who had 20 children, 13 survived from two marriages, um, seven become international musicians of quite considerable distinction. Now, whether that's because it's the family job or whether it's because there is some inherent ability, I think is still arguable. But in general, certainly if you go through the family trees of musicians, it's not very impressive. However, 
Um, this led in due, due course to the first eugenics congress, uh, unlike the Physiological Society. Um, it was held uh, not at the QE2, but at Imperial College in South Kensington. And everybody there was eugenic. I mean, you can look at this distinguished list. They were all really enthusiastic. All these scientists were enthusiastic about trying to improve our society by better, by better breeding. By the early 20s, certainly after the First World War, um, there's no question that the big um, impact was in the United States of America. And uh, certainly it became uh, a key issue in the States, led to some extent by scientists from Cold Spring Harbor, which of course, as you will appreciate, is still regarded as one of the great meccas, if not the mecca, of, um, of, um, of uh, genetics and uh, molecular biology. And in the mid-twenties, this young woman, Carrie Buck, who some of you will be familiar with, was um, abandoned by her mother and fostered out, um, not very successfully. Um, as a young teenager, she was raped and she got pregnant. And her, um, uh, and, uh, her child was taken into care, as she had been in care, and... Um, what is really shocking was that she was uh, taken up by the uh, Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which prevented miscegenation, for example, between different, different ethnic groups, reenacted in a large number of states in the United States. Some of those states didn't repeal that law until the 1960s. Uh, Carrie, um, Carrie Buck um, was then um, uh, sent for uh, sterilization by her surgeon on the grounds that she was unfit to bear children because she was an imbecile. Actually, she lived until, the, um, until 20 years ago, so quite recently. She only died relatively recently, and certainly there was no suggestion that she was educationally subnormal in any kind of way. Nonetheless, she was, um, there was an appeal to the Supreme Court, and seven judges uh, looked at her case, and they decided um, that uh, she should be sterilized under that famous judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, of whom, of course, you all know, who made some very remarkable and extraordinarily um, uh, humane judgments, not in this case. What he said there was it was better for the world if degenerates like this were sterilized. It's rather like vaccinating them, he said. Compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting of the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Now, that particular judgment in 1927, Buck versus Bell, Bell was the surgeon concerned, um, was cited by the defendant doctors at the Nuremberg trials in 1945 and in 1946. The eugenic movement in the United States was unquestionably very significant thereafter. Uh, one of the leaders was, um, was this man, um, uh, Harvey Lachlan, who was uh, one of the senior scientists at Cold Spring Harbor. He was appointed as the agent by the president to screen people who are coming into the United States for immigration. And here you see a rather chilling piece of paper, his honorary doctorate awarded to him at Heidelberg University in 1936. Well, you know what's coming, of course. By 1936, posters like this were up in Germany, and here it says, um, it costs you uh, 60,000 Reichmarks to keep this, um, this unfit patient alive, um, to learn what you should, it's your money, it says, and to learn what you should do about it, uh, read uh, Neues Folk. And of course, we know what happened to patients like him um, and many others. And of course, by the Second World War, of course, the eugenic policy in Germany was something which we even now find it difficult to speak about. Um, uh, here, um, I haven't got a photograph, perhaps just as well, of Auschwitz, but I do have one shocking photograph with the commandant, uh, uh, Hoss, uh, smoking a cigar in front of laboring people who you know are going to be regarded as unfit for any further work and they will go to the gas chamber within the next few days. What I want to say to you is something which I think is really 
intriguing and important. I don't think that that whole eugenic idea has ever lost, our humanity, uh, lost humans. I think it's something that has always cropped up well before Galton, and I think it's still present in our society now. When I was a young medic in the early 70s, I had managed to cobble together a surgical technique which made reversal of sterilization extraordinarily successful using a microscope. And we were able to get anything from a 70 to 90% success rate, which had been unheard of previously. And so women from all over the United Kingdom flocked in to my clinic to have their sterilization reversed. And I published this little paper. I don't often show papers I've published, but this one is in a, it was in the British Medical Journal, uh, which I published quite late by 77, although I'd done the work some three or four years earlier, um, which looked at the first 100 patients where I had inquired of them just why they'd been sterilized and what that request meant to them. These women were coming now because they felt a complete lack of self-esteem in many cases. They felt that sex had no meaning for them anymore. They felt badly damaged. Many of them said to me they didn't feel a proper woman. One or two women said very graphically indeed that during sex they feel like an empty vessel. In many cases, their partnership was no longer something that was satisfactory. Many of them have become anorgasmic and one or two were deeply depressed. And these were all undoubtedly perfectly normal, mentally healthy individuals. And what was impressive was that by far the biggest majority of these women had been sterilized and they had been sterilized because that they had requested a termination of pregnancy under the 1967 Act of Parliament. And the surgeon had agreed to terminate that pregnancy only if they were prepared to be sterilized. And that's something that really is, seems quite shocking now, but it shows you how, in fact, we as medics can easily misuse our power with very vulnerable people. And what is even more shocking is that at least four or five of these women were younger than any female medical students at Imperial College today. Some of them were 17 or 18. And they felt permanently damaged. Now, you might think, well, of course, this is, you know, the 70s, it went away. But actually, you can see that this kind of attitude is not unknown. The rather aptly named governor of this particular state prison in California, Heinrich, um, said that it was actually cheaper to sterilize women um, rather than paying for their unwanted children when they were prisoners in his, uh, in his prison. And this was only last year, reiterated again, incidentally, uh, this year. So certainly there's always been that pressure. Now you could argue that some of the work that you know, we've been doing in my own laboratory could be seen as eugenic because of course, one of the things that we were responsible for, Alan Hadiside and myself, was, was this little experiment. This is a historical film clip. You'll see this embryo dividing very rapidly because it's time-lapse photography, but of course it's much slower than that. But basically we were able, using uh, rather crude instruments which we designed ourselves in the laboratory, to remove a single cell from an embryo, analyze the DNA using uh, nested PCR, a form of gene amplification. Um, this, of course, is well before the, genome, the human genome was sequenced, and therefore identify the specific gene defect which had killed a child in that family. And this particular embryo belonged to a woman who typically had lost a baby from a single gene defect at the age of three and a half. And we, over five years, managed to, first of all, demonstrate that biopsy seemed to be safe in several mammal, mammals and were able to refine PCR in a single cell. As far as I know, we were the first persons to do um, polymerase chain reaction in a single cell. And here you see um, the embryo dividing. Um, and in a minute, the homemade instruments, which are invisible to the naked eye. In fact, if you wave them in the air, they would just break. But here's the suction pipette, which is going to stabilize the embryo under the television camera. Looks massive, of course, in the photograph. But the embryo is, of course, um, not, a, not a, uh, uh, less than a tenth of a millimeter across.
And here you see a tiny droplet of acid being placed on the zona, the outer shell of the egg, um, and with care, a single um, cell is removed, being rather careful not to suck up any sperm um, so that you don't have any stray DNA. And then, of course, that um, cell is broken down and analysed. Well, you could argue this was eugenic, this kind of screening for single gene defects, but it seems to me that here is a genuine medical need. And I think what was interesting about the first two first three patients we treated, we had two successful pregnancies in the first, uh, in the first week we did this. Actually, here they are. Um, this was one, uh, th these kids now are just 25, Lisa and Harriet, and there were two other twins. We had two embryos from both these mothers put back, and uh, they were called perfect babies by the press. The notion of a eugenic idea, but of course, what we're looking at is a single base pair deletion in three billion base pairs, that's all. So we're not really choosing the DNA. And in any case, Lisa's not a perfect baby. She's got this blemish on her chin, which is not due to a cell being taken away. It's because she fell over just before the photograph was taken. <laughs> um, but um, it's interesting to consider um, that people felt that this might be um, denigrating people with handicap in some way. I don't understand that because it seems to me that watching a child of two or three dying over a year is an awful thing for any parent. And what was interesting about both these mothers was that they were not prepared to have a termination of pregnancy. They said they, would, they, couldn't, they couldn't afford to play Russian roulette, they didn't want to watch a baby die, and they were bravely prepared to go through an entirely experimental treatment which, of course, we'd not been able to validate except in mice and other small mammals. Um, so that, I think, was, showed very great ba bravery on behalf of the parents of these kids. Now, in the journal Science, uh, Humphrey Logish published this comment on our work some years later. He said that it's now possible to um, look at the DNA, work out what proteins are being expressed, made, and soon we'll have supercomputers which will be able to take all this information, compile it in, a, in an effective way, and soon we'll be able to make a colour movie from the embryo's genetics and work out what the baby will not only look like when it's grown up, but also the mother will be able to see the movie before the embryo is put back in her uterus and she will hear the baby as an adult speak or sing. Well, you know, when the leading journal, one of the leading journals in the world says this of your work, and also it's one, it's one of the great molecular biologists, you're bound to feel very proud, if you're wise, for no longer than six minutes. You've heard of the God delusion. We have a science delusion as well, and that is really part of this issue. Part of the reason for giving this talk in this kind of way is that it's very easy for us to get seduced by our own ability to do things. And I think it's that which I think we need to be cautious about. Um, indeed, the eugenic um, ideas are not at all unusual. Here you have uh, Enoch Powell, who interestingly was one of the key figures who absolutely opposed in vitro fertilization in the, <coughs> in the UK. Um, uh, we, have the, um, we have Beveridge, who was the founder of the National Health Service. Uh, we have there in that photograph, we've got um, uh, James Watson, who you may remember, came from uh, Cold Spring Harbour and was refused uh, his platform to lecture at the, uh, at the Science Museum a few years ago because of his views on uh, intelligence in blacks and whites, which were regarded as being racist. And we have Nicholas Anelka, who of course did the famous Cornell and was not punished by his club uh, for what was a clearly an anti-Semitic gesture. This still carries on in our society, and I think that at times of conflict, when food is short, when water is short, when there is global change, global climate change, when there are all sorts of pressures in unstable societies, that may risk us as humans again. And that's part of this message. So, for example, this photograph, um, well, sorry, that was what Beveridge said. He wanted to stamp out want disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. What is rather horrible to show today on the day of the funeral of those three boys in Israel are these little six-year-olds or younger than that Palestinian girls making the sign of approval 
of, of, that, of that kidnapping. So this problem of um, uh, racial um, hatred is something which I think we need to be aware of, which is not actually diminished even in modern human society and will be made worse when there are tensions in our society, whatever those tensions are due to. And um, this is not to argue Israel's case or the Palestinians' case, but it's to point out that those situations actually endanger all of us in a very real sort of way. Now, um, let's come to the announcement of the human genome. This is June the 26th, year 2000. So here's Francis Collins. Here's Craig Venter looking rather embarrassed. And that, you may know, is President Clinton. So this is the first publication. It's amazing to think of a scientific achievement that can have such a huge announcement. At the White House, we won't hear for a moment what President Clinton says. Um, just to say a little bit about Francis Collins. Francis Collins, of course, is a deeply Christian individual who has a religious view. Uh, nothing against that, by the way. Uh, Craig Venter uh, is an absolutely confirmed atheist, relevant to my next slide, which is why I say that to you. <clears throat> but what Clinton says here, and Tony Blair, of course, is actually down the line in London at the time. Tony Blair says that this tells us more about our humanity than any previous uh, human achievement. Uh, Blair, um, uh, Michael Dexter from the Wellcome Trust, who funds part of this, says this is a more important scientific achievement than the invention of the wheel. And President Clinton says that we have drawn, with God's help, a map, the most important map ever drawn by humankind. Well, <clears throat> you could argue, actually, that the map of Washington is a good deal more useful at the present time. You could also argue, I suppose, that maybe what Shakespeare did in 1599 when he wrote Hamlet tells us quite a lot about our humanity. And if indeed the wheel is the most important invention, certainly when it comes to the genome, this is an invention that hasn't rotated much yet. And I think whilst I have absolutely nothing against the sequencing of the human genome, I think it's very risky for us as scientists when these greatly exaggerated claims are made because they raise all sorts of expectations, as you will see, which sometimes can't be fulfilled afterwards, and they devalue actually what we can do in the society in which we work. Now, what I'm going to show you now is an example of how this kind of work can be reinterpreted. So I'm going to show you the same clip again, but this time from a religious program, which was made by Irish television, uh, using exactly the same footage that you've just seen. We'll need the sound up a little bit more, I think, to hear the soundtrack. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by Dr. Francis Collins. We are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Today we are learning the language in which God created life. When you look at the sequence of the human genome, our own instruction book, these three billion letters that determine all of the biological attributes of a human being, it's a pretty awesome experience. After all, out of this research, most of us believe we will arrive at cures for terrible diseases that we currently don't have much to offer for. And I think our strongest mandate down through the centuries of the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, one of the strongest mandates, is healing. It's going to make more difference than any other single scientific advance for doctors like me and for medical scientists. It will completely revolutionize the way that people investigate and treat human disease. <laughs> 
instead of wandering around looking for treatments, as happened with antibiotics, or stumbling across them, we'll have a map in our hand. When you try to work out what range of illnesses will be influenced by the Human Genome Project, the only one that might not be is traffic accidents. Of course, the, the problem is, of course, that the human genome sequencing so far has not actually really contributed that much to treatment. And certainly the really important diseases in our society, which include heart disease, diabetes, um, cancer to a large extent, really the real impact of genomics has been pretty slight. And of course, the single gene defects that we've just been looking at in that embryo are not treatable by any uh, genetic medicine really to a large extent anyway, that's certainly true. And of course, moreover, one of the problems, of course, is that even single mutations causing a particular disease often have different expressions in different individuals, and that actually creates another problem of confusion. So there is a risk here, I think, of our, in our enthusiasm, natural enthusiasm, exaggerating the impact of what we can do, which influences policymakers and, of course, as we know, in this case, governments. Now, let's look at what happened when Carol Carwellita had her entire genome sequenced by the Observer newspaper. They paid quite a lot of money for this, and she had a five-page spread. Because, of course, it's obviously going to be very predictive of disease. Well, it turned out, of course, that she learnt that she had the male pattern baldness gene, in inverted commas. Um, but she could have learnt that by looking at her two brothers and her father, probably. Um, she has a sprinter's power gene. Well, bear in mind that this article was published shortly after the Olympics, so one can accept there was a certain amount of interest in being a sprinter. Whether or not she can run fast, I have no idea, but I can't believe it would make much difference to her lifestyle. Um, she might have late onset Alzheimer's, but she refused to actually uh, have that area analysed. So she asked not to be told that information, probably quite wisely, because it's not that predictive, probably anyway. It's not been fully validated. Um, she has, as it turns out, a mutation for galaxy, gal galactosemia. Now, that sounds like really quite useful information until you begin to realise that this is a mutation which probably affects about one in 16,000 people. So the chances of meeting somebody with that recessive defect and having a child in consequence, pretty small. So really, in practice, it's not very important. And she has no breast cancer gene. Great. But then, of course, that actually reduces her risk by a very slight amount, perhaps one or maybe 2%, because, of course, the background risk is really there in our society due to the environment rather than the genetics. And she has the waist circumference, circumference gene which I have as well, and most of you have probably as well, too. <laughs> uh, finally, she said that she had the gene for conscientiousness. So I sent her an email. I sent her an email saying I was interested to see that she had a conscientious, conscientiousness gene. Um, how, was that how she managed to persuade the editor of The Observer to publish five pages of this stuff um, on, a, on a Sunday? And she didn't reply to my email. <laughs> But of course, one of the issues, of course, is this, that when it comes to drugs which are designed to target bits of the genome, particularly, and they've been burgeoning, for example, in cancer drugs, they look often really very exciting. This is a very good example, um, uh, vemurafenib, which, um, which is a BRAF inhibitor. Um, really, um, the initial publications in the New England Journal looked astonishing because, of course, what we were seeing within 14 days was drying up of these metastases which had spread across this dying patient. But it turned out, of course, that perhaps not entirely surprisingly, that the effect was rather short-lived. And actually, although this was considered the great breakthrough in melanoma treatment, actually the, the survival of these patients is still pretty short because, of course, in tumours of this kind, I imagine the reason is that new mutations are occurring all the time because of the rapid cell division. So clearly, this targeted approach is not necessarily going to be the great success. And I think that, again, one has to be very cautious about these sorts of claims without trials. But as I say, it's so easy to get seduced by one's cleverness. This is from a single embryo taken from our laboratory, and Michael Schneider has dosed it at Imperial College to make uh, these cells into 
cardiomyocytes, and here you see uh, a block of uh, muscle in his laboratory beating. When you see this down the microscope, the sense of wonder that you have, the sense of awe, and to some extent power that you have, the idea that you might influence medicine in the future uh, is, is, is extraordinary. And so I think that that actually is a wonderful thing for a researcher, but it also should carry some alarm bells in your brain to be very cautious actually how you interpret the possible uses. Um, in my own field, of course, as women have been increasingly empowered and gaining equality, leaving um, partnerships later and later because they want to gain skills and get education, of course, as they should do, um, there's been this pressure to freeze eggs in a burgeoning market. So sometimes this mixture of desperation of the patient and the cost, uh, costs and therefore the profits that could be made have really made this very big business in the United States and to some extent in London too. When you model uh, freezing eggs, it's not quite so impressive. Um, here you see, even on the tube, um, there are uh, now posters. Now, what I find rather depressing, of course, is that if I, as a medical practitioner, advertised in this sort of way, I'd be struck off by the medical research, by the medical, the general medical council. But a person running a clinic, owning that clinic, can hide behind the clinic's name, and that might, that seems to me, happening increasingly in this rather extraordinary market. Um, but when you look at the model, well, it's very simple. The average cycle might yield 10 eggs to freeze. Uh, the average fertilization rate, for example, might be about 70% after thawing. Um, the average thaw rate is probably about one third. Average implantation rate of each human embryo is about 18 to 24%. 20% is not a bad hit rate. It's a bit less than after freezing, actually. So you'd expect less than 10% success rate. And it turns out, actually, that that's exactly what we see. And from the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, we've learned recently that 243 women have had their eggs stored, have had 253 cycles, and less than 10% of them have got pregnant. So it's not the great success rate that it should be. There may be other ways of dealing with increasing female fecundity later on in life. In my view, we should be able to preserve oocytes in the ovary, which might well be a lot safer uh, than this technique. But the problem, of course, is that once you have this sort of market going on, it actually inhibits research rather than increases it. And that, I think, for academics is a real problem. It also forgets something very important. And that is that when we meddle with a human in early development, we are in very much uncharted territory. We may be interfering with not just the genome, but actually with how genes actually work, and in particular, epigenetics. Now, this isn't entirely new. Linnaeus, of course, who you will remember in the mid 18th century was that great taxonomist um, from Scandinavia who really classified plants, was a God-fearing biologist who um, was a great believer that all plants had been created at the time of creation. So it was very puzzling to him when he came across Linaria vulgaris, which in some environments showed this particular morphology, which he couldn't understand. And he said that this was no less remarkable than if a cow had given birth um, to a calf with a wolf's head. He didn't understand this, but of course, it turned out that in a single generation, um, what could happen was environmental influences on genetic expression. We now know, of course, quite recently, that that is an epigenetic phenomenon. It was only, um, only discovered about uh, 15 years ago that that was an ep epigenetic phenomenon. And those sorts of issues mean that, for at least temporarily, that may be inherited uh, by further plants. So in a kind of way, you're changing, you're changing evolution uh, almost in a single generation. I mean, to exaggerate a bit. Um, is epigenetics important? I think it probably is going to be very important indeed. This mouse experiment, also done in rats by Francois Champagne and Michael Meany and others as well at McGill University, gives a very good example of what I mean. There are some rodents that do not nurture their young in the nest very well. They breastfeed them, but they don't lick them, they don't cosset them. And it turns out that when that happens, although the DNA is not misprinted in any kind of way, 
methylation patterns change so that the genes don't act in the way that you'd expect as a result of exposure to that particular environment. The net result, of course, is changing in estrogen receptor expression in the, um, uh, in the preoptic area of the brain. And these animals, when they grow as adults, are cognitively often different from a control group. They can't find their way out of a maze. They can't remember where a platform underwater is. And interestingly, they pass this trait on to another generation. So something the grandmother has done may affect what happens to the grandchildren. Now, of course, I'm not saying that epigenetic effects like this aren't reversible. They probably are. But they may be responsible for quite important issues in our society. We're very good at dealing with great detail of what's happening in a single cell. And certainly in Britain, we are very much in the forefront of medical research. In fact, um, we're leading. We're certainly equal to the United States. But actually, the really important issues in some ways in our society, uh, and that is true of America as well, is what's actually happening in public health. And that is a very difficult issue. So, for example, here you see in Colton that the life expectancy of a male, the average life expectancy in Glasgow, in this part of Glasgow, is 54, which is actually lower than it is in uh, Mali, lower than it is in Mozambique, and many other parts of Africa. But if you walk six miles to Lenzi, you have one of the highest expectancies in the world, and it turns out that the genetics of those populations aren't fundamentally different. What is much more likely, I think, is that there is some difference in the environment. Interestingly, my niece, who's a Cambridge mathematician, Rebecca Landy, looked at this population in some detail and corrected for things like obesity, heart disease, smoking, uh, alcohol abuse, and found there's something else going on. It could well be that there's a developmental influence going on as a result of the environment that these uh, men as boys are brought up in, or perhaps even a preconceptual environmental change, that would not be entirely surprising. We have some evidence from Sweden that happens in other populations uh, as well. Meanwhile, of course, we are so focused on genomics that we go to extraordinary lengths. Now, to look at that single cell in the embryo, here's one experiment by uh, Dr. Voert in, um, in Belgium, who's looking at a single cell of the embryo, trying to see gene expression. And of course, there's such a mass of data here, it's difficult to see how you would disentangle what's really happening. Um, uh, we, of course, can certainly do this, but many uh, uh, rather exaggerated claims are made for the importance of this. But it's interesting how that gene expression changes in a few hours, depending on the time in the cell cycle. You can see rather clearly in that photograph. And moreover, of course, there seems to be a possible, a possible epigenetic effect from taking a cell away from that embryo, which may be justified if you're trying to prevent a fatal genetic disorder, may be less justified if you're simply trying to choose an embryo which is more likely to implant and become a child. You can see in this mouse experiment uh, by Yang Yu that even with blastocysts, uh, which generally are rather more robust, there's a change in their intelligence after biopsy of this kind, and indeed, uh, ultrastructure examination of brain cells shows demyelinization patterns, not dissimilar entirely from disseminated sclerosis. So uh, there is, I think, a concern that we need to be very clear that we need to be more and more recognizing of the importance of possible epigenetic effects. Finally, this question about being human in the future. One of the concerns I think I want to express is that, of course, until recently, much of our real work in genetics has been most importantly run as a result of doing experiments like this, by doing, uh, modifying mice, making them transgenic. Transgenic technology has, in real terms, been much more important, I think, than, for example, the human genome, because it's really translated very effectively into all sorts of medical problems, uh, models for medical for disease, um, uh, removal of genes by knockout or knockdown has enabled us to disentangle genetic influences in a very uh, dynamic way. Uh, this was a particular model for alopecia in the mouse. The problem has been that making um, 
uh, transgenic animals is, 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 is incredibly inefficient. In fact, making a transgenic mouse means that most of the time you don't get the transgene into the genome, and when you do, it doesn't express. If it does express, it only express temporarily, perhaps not for several generations, and this has been a particular problem. Carol Reedhead and I got quite interested in this, and we thought possibly about doing something about it. You can see the power of transgenics. Well, this rather nice uh, film clip, which is available on the web from Hakimi in Chicago. This is the super mouse, which has had its DNA modified mitochondrial DNA to some extent and nuclear DNA. And it actually can tolerate much more exercise than normal. So that's, that's the modified mouse. This mouse is normal and wisely gives up the treadmill after about 200 meters. This mouse carries on. Now, this isn't cruelty because it loves running. An hour later, it's still running. <laughs> Question is, can it run for two hours? It can run for two hours and it's still running. Now running twice as fast because they speeded up the treadmill. And three hours later, it's still running. And actually, amazingly, four hours later, it's still running. When it takes a short breather and then starts again. Now, the interesting thing about that mouse, of course, is that if you think about it, whilst this method of getting the genes into the animal are highly inefficient, it took a lot of trial and error to do it, you can see the potential power of enhancement. So there's no need to ever run the Olympic Games again because, of course, you could modify muscle activity. You could change, perhaps, intelligence or memory. You could certainly change height. You could probably look for certain physical characteristics which are desirable in current society. Blonde hair, for example, if you like blonde hair. Um, I'm sorry, that's not meant to be in any way an insult to anybody <laughs> who's either a brunette or blonde. What Carol and I were interested in doing was to try to find a more successful way, way of making transgenics because over the last 13 years we've been trying to work with getting our DNA in more effectively. And we decided really to target the sperm cell because of course in large animals it's very difficult to get hold of embryos and highly expensive. And large animals as transgenics are really useful models and we also realized too that you might be able to modify eventually the cell surface antigens, for example, on the pig kidney and make a transplantable organ after xenografting and the other uses of that kind or perhaps humanized organs for drug experimentation. So here we've got, in fact, we're able to put, in fact, um, uh, genes in the sperm, uh, into mature sperm now. And it turns out that this method of transgenesis is extraordinarily efficient. We've just published about a 50% success rate, but the truth is it's probably already close to 80%. Um, and you see it rather nicely in these four embryos from a, a larger animal. Set to Schubert, <laughs> seductively. But it raises a very interesting question, ladies and gentlemen. Because if you can enhance, let's say, a rat or a pig with this technology, why not go the whole hog? And why not enhance a human? Given the market, given the extraordinary desires of people to really want to better their children, given the frictions in world society, and given the history of eugenics, you could see how a technology like this could be seriously misused. And the question is, if we made superhumans by this kind of technology, what price would be our humanity? That's the question. Thank you for listening to me.